So in this lab, we're going to look at some of the timer resources in the AT Mega. So this is lab number four. And there's going to be a few things is either uh, the using it for event timing. So this is timing between two events occurring. Uh, pulse width modulation, so you can control the speed of motors or the brightness of LEDs. And actually measuring a pulse width. So this is useful if uh, you need to do things like sensors that give you pulse width outputs or cases like where you want to measure the time of flight between sending a burst of sound out and hearing the echo back. All right, so uh, part one, basically all you need is an LED to do this part. So the schematic actually has the push button, which we do use in part two. But what I'm gonna do is just be lazy and wire up my, um, have my dev board here and just wire up the LED to port D7 as usual. Uh, we have a resistor for doing the current limiting so you don't blow up your LED and connect the ground. So this is all we need. So the objective is we're going to just do a simple uh, blinking blinking LED type deal uh, once again. But now we're going to have very precise timing on the blinking of the LED. So turn this off. Um, and again, the push button we'll use in the next part. So, assume that we have a um, a project started, and again, see the previous labs if you forget how to do this. It's pretty basic. What we're going to do is, I'm actually going to start making macros now. So, f for the C, this will just give us a nice LED on, uh, you know, macro. So, port D, just set the port pin high or set the port pin low. So LED off, port D, ooh. Keyboard's going crazy here, sorry. There we go, so it's either uh, goes high or low. So as part of the main, we'll set that pin as a output. So just set that bit to one. And we need to configure the timer, so uh, the timer control register, there's two registers, and I'll just put in these blanks right now. Um, we need to set something. So this will allow us to configure how frequently the timer timing event occurs. Uh, so you can look at the lab, which links you to the AT Mega datasheet, figure out these values. The other thing you're going to have to do is enable timer interrupts. Um, so we do this with the TI MSK, uh, so this timer mask and timer mask zero, we're using, there's a few different timers, so we're using timer zero. Um, we'll set this to whatever the interrupt is we want, and we'll enable global interrupts. So this lab is actually starting to use interrupts now. Uh, so you can read uh, the lab to figure out how some of that works. So. If you reference the lab, what you'll see is it uh, talks about some of these tables that figure out how to set the, um, the timer values. So in this case, what we're doing is we're dividing the input clock uh, by some setting. So in this case, we're taking the, the clock of the device and we're going to divide it by, you know, what did we say here? Um, if CS00 is set to 1 and CS0 one is set to one. So you can see the data sheet to figure out what the division is. And I believe it's this one right here. So it's dividing the clock by um, 64. So that's that 14 point some megahertz clock, 14 point uh, 745 megahertz clock. All right, so I'm gonna copy these values in. So if you were doing your own uh, lab, you'd sort of, or doing your own system, you might have to figure out what other values you might need. Um, and then for the timer interrupts, you'll have to figure out what the uh, what the interrupt is you're gonna want. So in this case, what we're using is a uh, overflow enable. So TO, TOIE zero means timer overflow, interrupt enable for timer zero. Um, so we just say to set that bit. Timer overflow interrupt enable zero. And this will configure the timer with a certain uh, count. 
And basically every time it overflows, so it's an 8-bit counter, uh, every time it counts up past hex FF, it's going to overflow and trigger our, um, our timer interrupt. So if you look at the lab, and you'll have to figure out what the what the signal name should be here. And we also need to include uh, AVR slash signal.h, is it? Let me look at my reference code. Interrupt.h. Uh, so this just tells the compiler uh, what some of the interrupt names are and stuff like that. Um, so in this particular one, if you go online and look at the uh, website, the AVR libc doc, you can figure, see a list of all the names, and you've got to double check it's relevant to your microcontroller, so the ATmega644 we're using, um, this timer zero overflow vector. So go ahead and say timer zero overflow vector. Um, so every, you know, however much we calculate, this uh, interrupt is going to be called. So what I'm going to do is, in this interrupt, um, I'm actually setting up a variable to be changed. So you'll have to go through, and there's different ways to do this, but basically what I'm going to say is that uh, I'm going to count this tick variable, uh, and the tick is just, you know, tick of a clock, like tick tock, and not like the bug, the tick. <laughs> anyway, so let's do that. So all this is doing is uh, increments the tick. If the tick is set to one, it turns the LED off. Um, when it reaches 400, it turns the LED on, off. Sorry, it was on before, off now. And then at 900, it overflows, which will mean it'll turn the LED back uh, on again. And the last thing we need to do is we need that variable. So I could make this an 8-bit an uh, variable, unsigned chair tick. And to make it more obvious that it's 8-bit, you can do stuff like it, use uint uh, t. The only other trick that's very critical is that um, for this to work, you actually need this to be marked as a volatile. And it actually should be an unsigned. I'm going to use an int because what will happen is I forgot I'm using up to like 900 here. That's bigger than you can represent with an 8-bit. Um, so we have to mark it as volatile to tell the compiler that this variable could be incremented at in the interrupts at any point. Uh, otherwise, it will just assume it's never incremented because the compiler doesn't necessarily know about these interrupts being called. Um, so I could build it, and then we're just going to use all of the same um, methods as before. So lab four. program. There we go. So if I switch to my camera, what you'll see is that we now have a blinking LED. And this blinking LED was done with the, um, the timer subsystem, not just using the uh, delays macro. So you can do other stuff while this, this is all happening. So in this, the while loop uh, if I look back at the code, there's this while loop here. And so you could actually write all the code you want here, uh, and it's not going to be delayed. If you had just used delay ms500, what's going to happen is that code is just going to spin in this loop uh, while it waits for 500 milliseconds to pass. The way it is now, you can do other stuff, and the timer is taking care of dealing with the LED blinking. So that's just a really simple example. The second part of the lab is using um, what's known as the input compare. So let's go down here. Um, or actually using the pulse width modulation output. So in this case, what we want to do is we're going to generate a special signal that um, allows us to modify the pulse width. So the percentage of the time the duty cycle is high or low. 
So the lab goes through some of the code you'll need and you can figure out all of the, um, the configuration. I'll just show you again, the objective here is to show you what um, the end result of this code will be. So let me just do that. And this, we don't care about that warning there because um, this delay is just being used to increment the pulse width modulation setting. Just let me program that. And again, it tells you to reload, which is great. And what you see is that we now have this LED that sort of uh, goes from, you know, low brightness to high brightness. And it's just, uh, uh, you know, a nice little pattern. So that's because we're incrementing the, uh, the variable representing the um, the pulse width modulation. And the other thing that you will want to do is actually connect a scope. So I've got a scope probe here. This might look a little different from the one you have, but it's all the same. So one side goes to negative. Um, and the positive side put on, make sure you put it so it's connected right to the pin of the, uh, the AVR. And if I turn off my camera here, you can adjust to get a nice, oops, it's too much, a nice signal. And you can see here, so this is this pulse width modulation. Um, so here, for example, it's spending a lot more time high than it is spending low. Um, so, you know, here it's spending 200 microseconds high and then only 77 microseconds low. So that, that would be a brighter LED than if we try to stop it. Uh, just randomly find one here. There we go. So at this point in time, you know, it's spending most of the time 200 microseconds low and 70-ish microseconds high. Um, so as part of the lab, you can do that, and you can also measure what the the frequency is by measuring the uh, the total time of this waveform. So you can adjust, play with some of the timer settings to also figure out how that's all effective. Um, so in the, the final part, part three of the lab, what we're going to do is look at the input capture system. So this is how we can measure the uh, time a button is low or high for, or the, the time delay signal, um, all sorts of stuff. So this is a really useful feature. And to do this, we're going to wire a push button into, move it up here, so I have the push button and I'm wiring it into port D pin six. So this is slightly different from the setup you have in the earlier parts, just in what pin it goes into. So I just have it into port D pin six instead. And uh, the objective will be to download, create some code that reads this value uh, and then measures how long the button's pressed for and lights this LED up only if we press the button for an okay amount of time. So I have, taken the code and loaded it here. Um, turn off the camera. And basically we enable, the input capture is always on a special pin, the ICP pin. Uh, we enable a noise canceller on it and we start looking for a falling edge. So initially we're looking for uh, the falling edge being, you know, when we press the button down and the button pulls everything low. Um, once it, it pulls that low, uh, it's going to, so if we look in the interrupt for when the input capture goes low, uh, it saves the timestamp. So at this point in time right here, it's saving it. Uh, it then switches it to look for the rising edge and again saves the timestamp. So then we have the rising edge when you release the button. And it's going to save this time up here. Uh, that time there. And what we need is the difference between those two points. So then the main code simply does this subtraction. Uh, you have to be careful because it's possible that the timer wraps around. So if it goes past the 16 bits, uh, it goes over at the beginning. So there's sort of just this really basic code. It doesn't check for overflow. Like if you push the button down for too long, uh, it wouldn't realize that it's wrapped around. But it's just a really simple example to show you this. So let me download this build it. I think it's built. Um, and 
what this one looks like is we have the button and so if I press the button down for the wrong amount of time nothing happens and it's only if I press it down I think it's supposed to be like a one second period so you can see me pressing the button here um, if I press it down within that one second period then everything the LED lights up indicating that it was held down for an okay amount of time so let me use this so if I hold it down for too long, uh, the light doesn't come on. So again, it's supposed to be about one second, so there you can see it's successful, successful, successful. Um, I forget what it was actually programmed in, so you can play with this a bit, and you can see if it's too long or too short, it doesn't light up. So that's the objective. I can press this a whole bunch of times, and it doesn't light, but if I hold it, it lights up. So that's part three of the lab.